Sugar, sugar! Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of What's So Funny, a show that talks about the funny with the people who make it happen. Now, our guest this week is making his first appearance since 2010 on the program. He's funny in all different kinds of languages. Il est très amusant, Sugar Sammy. And as well, your host, the man, Oak Bay's finest, Guy McPherson. Oh, thank you for that. That's the best intro you ever gave me, Sam. Oh, God. And you didn't <laughs> screw it up like the last one. And to, to Sugar Sammy, bonjour, mon ami. Bonjour. Uh, this is the first time we've spoken in French, guy. <laughs> and it will <laughs> and be the that's last. that's as far yeah. as we're going to get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I am half French. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, I've only spoken to you in English, and we've hung out in Vancouver, and I thought your French would be as good as every other Canadian's French outside of Quebec. <laughs> and you're right. <laughs> what is uh, amusing about that is uh, my mother was from France, where you're a big comedic star, and I have a French passport. And anytime I've had to go into the French consulate, they start speaking to me in French, and I, because I have a French passport, and I have to go, oh, hang on, I, I, I don't speak the language sacrilege they must hate you at that uh, at that embassy they do the yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't go often yeah but it's great yeah. talking to you we were just saying the last time you were on was 2010 and you were also on in 2009 now those are the two that are available to the world you were on two times before that and they're just lost oh somewhere. wow I yeah know. i remember yeah. i actually came in studio uh all the way yeah. on east hastings and i would walk it from my hotel so it's it's a surprise that I actually made it to the studio and then made it back to my hotel, and I'm here for <laughs> and you lived uh, it yeah, and I'm here for a fifth time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now from the uh, safety of your own home, yeah, technology has improved, amazing. Yeah, and by the way, where are you? Where is home? Still Montreal? Montreal. So I'm back in Montreal, isolating, uh, because uh, we left we left France uh, March 15th. So I had just finished a big U.S. tour, and then I was in the middle of a French tour, and I'd done everything but Paris, and I was ready to do my Parisian run. And right before my Parisian run, everything shut down, and everybody was like, we're closing the borders, and Canada was saying they're closing the borders, and I thought to myself, let's get home. Better isolate in Canada than uh, in France, that's for sure. Well, you've done the isolating part now, right? Yeah, I've done the isolating part. We're still kind of in confinement. I mean, I think Quebec's still a ways away from BC. I mean, I think BC guys are, are doing way better than we are right now. Thank you. We are in the all, best. In yeah. all aspects. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, could, uh, I could attest to that. And you guys have way more space to isolate, which I like. You know, I guess. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's good. It's interesting because when we have comedians on who play different countries of the world, they're always playing in English. But when you're doing these tours in France, they're in French. Yeah, they're in French. There are a couple of English nights that I pop into uh, with other fellow English comedians. So there's some English rooms, uh, not many, but uh, there's kind of this niche uh, um, uh, market for expats who, who want comedy in English. Uh, so I get to do that from time to time on days off, but usually it's all in French. Yeah, the big shows are in French over there. So do you um, do you live there so many months at a time? Uh, I do. So typically uh, it's gone from two months to four months at a time, but I'm usually there six to eight months out of the year, either touring or on my TV show over there. Oh, which TV show is that? Oh, I'm uh, I'm uh, one of the judges on France's Got Talent. Oh, yeah. So you guys know no, America's you're, you're, that's I saw that you're you're a judge on France has an incredible talent. <laughs> that's right. So it's the format uh, for uh, uh, America's Got Talent. <laughs> so I'm kind of the I, I have that like uh, chair on the right hand side, the one that Simon Cowell has. So I'm kind of the uh, <laughs> you know the uh, the jerk who tells everybody what the truth about their talents are. Really? Do you do that? Are you comfortable doing that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's fun. I think I've, you know, I've had enough of a career where I can be like, okay, sit it's fun back. fun crushing dreams, isn't that's, it? That's right. And just let, you know, just turn that frontal lobe off 
for a couple Be hours. The gatekeeper. <laughs> Don't let anyone else in in your showbiz world. Do you find that uh, doing that show has has bumped people coming to check out stand up? Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's people. Been big, eh? Yeah, it's been big for stand up. It's been big for my show over there for my tour, uh, mm-hmm. and definitely for notoriety. But yeah, it's been huge for stand up over there, and. Um, and I think, uh, you know, more and more in France, stand-up is becoming the norm. It used to be like one-man shows and, you know, these sort of one-man plays, one-woman plays, you know, with like a, a director and all those things. And like stand-up has kind of taken over just because I think all of these, uh, you know, these kind of gate gateways have opened up and people are seeing what's happening in North America. And it's way more efficient in terms of comedy than uh, than anything else. Oh, good. Mm. But, it, you know, but you're you're critiquing not just comedians on that show. No, I'm critiquing all art forms, which is fun. I mean, some that I didn't even think existed. I mean, there's a guy who came in and started, uh, you know, dancing with his broom, and that was his thing. This one guy came in whistling, and I had to let him know that, you know, not to quit his day job. And, you know, it's kind of really, it, yeah. Well, he he was a whistler, but it was horrible. <laughs> it was a horrible whistle. He was a horrible whistle because Tut Steelman made a career out of whistling uh, jazz, <laughs> and he was fantastic. He was from Belgium, not France. Yeah. So it is a thing over there, I guess. I guess it's a thing. I mean, it shouldn't be. That's the thing. It sh- I don't think it should yeah. be a thing. <laughs> it's forcing you to broaden your definition of art. Yeah. I mean, anything yeah. could be art, right? Art, well, they always say it's subjective. Well, and you see that on shows <laughs> like that. It is very subjective. <laughs> Broom dancing. Broom dancing. Huge. Uh, but are you ever the guy where the other three judges are all positive and then you come on and pour cold water over it? Always. I, I think I, oh. they disagree with me all the time. So so I think I am that guy who – I'm kind of the voice, the inner voice of the viewer, you know? That inner voice that tells you, <laughs> ah, that's not good. And I got to say it. That's my role anyways, you know? So it's kind of say it in jest. They tell you to don't hold back, I guess, but there must be some that you just love as well. Yeah, yeah. The ones I love, I love, you know, so uh, I'm honest, too. It's, I'm not just there to crush dreams. I'm there to be honest and also to uh, to actually encourage uh, the great ones. And there are they're definitely uh, uh, loads of them. Um, there's so many people that you discover who, you know. I think just didn't get the the chance to, to to make it out there. Sometimes I even say some of the best comedians must be people who, you know, haven't reached their full potential. They're somewhere at home. They their inner voice is telling them they can do it, and they just haven't had the opportunity or the guts to go up and and do it. But there's like they have that spark and they have that seed in their brain, and they probably have the right brain to write and to perform stand up, but just no one's nourish that and they just haven't been ha- been in the right environment for that you know so sometimes you see that you see people who you're like wow this person is actually a genius at what they do and we're so surprised that nobody's found this person before are the other judges um celebrities that we would know uh i mean no they're all celebrities from france so uh we have yeah a- yeah so Eric Antoine, Gerard Depardieu. <laughs> no, Gerard Depardieu, no. I mean, he could, he's barely coherent enough to actually make it to the studio, I think, these days. But I, I, <laughs> I think it's like <laughs> Eric Antoine, uh, who's a, a like huge over there. He's a comedian magician, but like just a mega big name. There are hosts a bunch of shows on that same network that we're on. Hélène Cigara, who's like a musical legend, and Marianne James, who was a judge on a couple of other big um shows there and david ginola was our host up until recently he's uh, actually a major soccer player oh yeah uh, turned host yeah so he was uh, he was hosting it for the last two years when i was there sam don't pretend that you know him oh i know david ginola for sure yeah, oh, okay <laughs> this is the accent I other than have. that i have no idea yeah who any Do of you- those other people are okay i'll tell you guy guy uh david ginola is like the trevor linden of uh mm-hmm. French soccer. He played for Tottenham. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. Oh, he played for Tottenham. Yeah. Hot Spurs. That's right. Uh do you have to uh adjust your your patois from Quebec to make it understandable to the people of the cultured people of France? Definitely. Because uh you know, <laughs> yeah, you have to. You have to. I actually have a joke about that when I talk about that here. You know, you have to Actually, when you go to France, you have to be a you know a more sophisticated, more eloquent, uh, more eloquent, more sophisticated, you know. But it's good to come back home in Quebec and be a lesser version of myself. 
So, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you do have to over there have like a, at least I have an international French. So it's not like I have the French slang from Paris and I'm using their expressions and their slang is I'm, I'm actually keeping it very middle of the road dictionary French. So it's kind of like a Radio Canada French, right? I see. Yeah. And why is that? Why do you have that kind of French and not the uh, the street Quebec French? Uh, the street Quebec French, they wouldn't understand. I'd have to repeat everything. And in stand-up. Yeah, but, which is natural to you, mm-hmm. is what I'm trying to say. Like, why uh, Did you have to develop this sort of international French? Or w- what comes naturally to you? Well, I think to me, naturally, it's an international French. That's what I always had. And then when I did Quebec, I sort of learn more of the Quebec expressions because you're hanging out with more Quebecois people. So the more it's like it, it'd be the same thing if I went to Argentina and I did it in Spanish, I'd learn their local slang and it would kind of infiltrate my stand up. But when I went to France, I was conscious not to be too French because they know I'm from somewhere else and like he's trying too hard. So I just mm-hmm. said, just keep it international enough so that it's an international French. And you're so that way you just build a bridge still staying who you are, you know, not letting go of who you are. And then at the same time, uh, connecting with that audience. It's sort of like going to England as a comedian, but not using all the British expressions, you know, because I feel like that would keep it authentic. You know, I think a lot of Canadians who succeed in England are the ones who stay Canadian and are understandable, but don't go over there and start speaking like the Brits and pick up their their local slang. You know? Yeah, you don't want to be a complete it's not a sellout but um just uh what's the word i know yeah just trying to suck up to the audience exactly i guess exactly a hack you don't want to be a hack (laughs) i don't want to be a hack no matter how you how you perform uh now it's interesting because it was written that you know the funniest guy in france is a guy from quebec which is you sugar sammy and and then you think of the other uh funniest guy in France, and he's from Morocco, although uh, Gad Elmele got his start in Montreal. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He did. So it's like the two top names there. Are the French comics, all? are there also great comics from France? Uh, I think more and more, you know, I think the old guard is kind of disappearing and the new, uh, the newer standups are taking over. You know, I think, uh, I don't think Gad is at the top of his game the way he used to be in France. I think the, you know, a lot of the shots fired, shots fired, truth, truth fired. And then, uh, (laughs) and he did get, um, you know, called out by the media there for a lot of plagiarism and things like that. I mean, that you guys could look up. Uh-huh. Yeah, so that, uh, you know... I think I heard about that. I didn't look into it, but yeah. Yeah, so there's like, you know, historically, according to the media, lots of um, lots of similarities between him and some American comics historically, you know, just uh, uh, became the gist of his act, kind of. So, so a lot of the newer ones who are, you know, actually grinding and going into the clubs and working on their act and stuff like that are really coming up. You have some really, you have a really good level uh, starting to uh, gain momentum there in um, in France, uh, France, Belgium, Switzerland. You have some really great comics uh, making their way up. They're actually, uh, you know, Switzerland, give, Switzerland. They have at least really. I, I can tell you at least two uh, really great comics right now in Switzerland who travel to France and stuff, but uh, who are give based their on names Thomas Wiesel and Marina Holman. So these are two I think you got to watch out for. And they're both bilingual. So they speak English. It'd be worth a shot to have them on the show. Wow. Definitely. Uh, you could be my middleman. Sure. I'll connect you, man. Anytime. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, it's no surprise to me how successful you've been in France, not just because of the international uh, accent, I guess, but you you have that suave, debonair uh, thing about you too, which I imagine goes over well there. Well, thanks. I don't know. I got, <laughs> I, I, I don't do any of that on purpose, but, um, no, that's why you're sugar, baby. <laughs> uh, but no, I think it's also, you know, I think it's a very Canadian thing. I think Canadian comedians across the board, uh, I've seen connect in more countries than most other comics. Like if, if a Canadian, co- I've seen Canadian comedians do well in the States, in uh, the UK, in South Africa, in Australia, in all kinds of different places, more than I've seen Americans do well in all of these. Like, I, I haven't seen many Americans connect with the UK audience and many 
Brits connect with an American audience, you know? So I think mm. it's very Canadian of us. I think Canadians are just kind of, uh, I think we're, we're, we're bred in a different way. Like we're, we're, we just want to get along. We want to get along and we want to get to know a different audience too. And we want to get to know people a lot. And we, I think we're very open like that, like this mosaic we live in, I think definitely benefited, uh, comedians, uh, in a big way because we're able to build bridges rather than building walls. How's that one? Hey. <laughs> so political. Uh -huh. It's pretty great. It's yeah. political here. Yeah. yeah. Very prescient. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, we it's we got to do the cold read part of the show now, Sam. <laughs> All right. Uh, what, what are we? Now, hey, by the way, what by are, the way, last time you were on, you said you were transitioning to Sam Kular, <laughs> your name. Oh, yeah. Uh, but you're still Sugar Sammy, right? It never happened. It gained too much momentum. You know what happened? Yeah. Is I got really huge as Sugar Sammy right after that show. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It was the What's So Funny bump yeah. that did it. Yeah. So now if you scroll to, scroll to the bottom of the page, uh, you'll have an assignment here. Okay. All right. This is Sugar Sammy, and you're listening to What's So Funny on CF. Okay, we'll do that again. This is Sugar oh, Sammy. Good Lord, Sammy. I thought you were a professional. <laughs> I almost had it. I almost had it. This is Sugar Sammy, and you're listening to What's So Funny on CFRO 100.5 FM Vancouver Co-op Radio. All right. Nicely go. done. Uh, yeah, and so uh, I we didn't make the introduction with, you know, we have a Sam now on the show uh, before it was a Kevin. Uh, okay. When you were there, yeah. Uh, so, and Sam Tawny, he's a, a younger comedian. I mean, he's not young, but you know. No. Uh, but I mean, Sam Sugar Sam, you've been uh, at it now a long time because, like, you were on our show in 2010, and you'd been at it a long time. Yeah. Like, how many years have you been in it now? This is uh, my 24th year now. Whoa. 24th, and what year do you think that you? Like where where it all just clicked, I mean, because you're a natural on stage anyway. But was there a year where you went? Was it right after our last, like you say, <laughs> your last appearance on the show? Yeah. Where <laughs> that's when I had an epiphany. Everything just fell into place. As I was yeah. walking back to my hotel on East Hastings, I was like, "Praying that's, for that's your life." <laughs> um, you know, I think there are different levels in your career, different times in your career when you hit different milestones, either creatively or professionally. So I can't say there's one moment, but there have been certain periods where I've seen myself either grow as a comic and really, you know, jump to another level and it keeps happening, right? And it should keep happening and because if it doesn't, then that's a real issue. That means you've plateaued and that's not a good thing. So I think there are definitely... Um, parts of my career where I've seen that and I've seen that also professionally where I've had, you know, uh, either, um, different changes in my career or, you know, um, a, a upward mobility in my career. And I think that just has to be a goal from year to year. You just have to always look back and go, your new material and your new work is better than your old work. And I think when that gap gets smaller, the smaller that gets, the better you're getting. So that means, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you look back five years and like, wow, I can't believe I did that on stage. And that's great, but it's great when it happens almost every year, or every couple of years. We're like, wow, I'm writing so much better and I wouldn't do that anymore. And wow, I've mm. progressed to such a big level. Once that gap gets shorter, it's like your progression is is, is happening way, way more rapidly. You know? and, and I think maybe for Sam Tawning, mm -hmm. a piece of advice that you could take away is to learn a few more languages. Ah. <laughs> that's, it's a Man. tough one. I didn't. I didn't learn these as an adult, so that's that's the advantage I had. I grew up with those. It's tough to learn languages as an adult. I've always wanted to learn Spanish and Portuguese, but those, yeah. you know, as an adult, it's very very tough. And then let alone be funny, yeah. and then that would just be showing off. Yeah, but what I would say, what definitely helps is do as many shows as possible in, in as many different contexts. So if you can just put yourself in danger all the time and do it in different contexts, that's great. And also do it in as many different countries if you can do it or different cities or, mm -hmm. you know, just change it up for your brain. As much as you can do that, do it. That that gets you, you it makes you so much more creative than anybody else who doesn't do that and is just formatted and has their, you know, has, has sort of their circle of, 
shows that they do and their circuit of shows that they do and then they stick yeah. to that year after year you get way more creative when you leave and you do something else so when you were um coming up was there you wouldn't turn down any gig i imagine whereas now you can be a bit more choosy yeah no i'm pickier now but uh no i i i used to do everything i could uh now what challenges me more is i'd rather you know instead of taking you know a gig at home that's like you know that's like the 30th time i've done that type of gig uh if i have an offer to go to another country or another city you know, or a state in the U.S. that I haven't done, I'd jump on that chance. Even if it's like less money, I'd be like, okay, I want to do this because I know it's good for my brain and I know it's just going to be something interesting. It's going to open up another door uh, in terms of creativity, you know? Do you know uh, what Wikipedia says? How many countries you've played? <laughs> oh, shoot. I don't know. I know. I know it's 33 now, I think. 32 or 33. Okay, yeah. W Wikipedia is close. They're a bit behind. It says 31. Oh, 31. Yeah, I think I'm at 32 now. Hmm. You just said 33. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Now you're backing <laughs> off. A bit. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. But I'd, I'd love to do 33. <laughs> that's a lot. I, I'd love to yeah, do more. That's a lot. Yeah. I think, I, What's the, I think oh, Eddie, Eddie Izzard is probably one of the only ones who has more than I do. Really? Yeah. Wow. I think so. Uh, not even like Russell Peters, because he plays a lot. Maybe. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, we'd have to check his Wikipedia, but I know Eddie Izzard. Your arch uh, rival. I, I, was, I, I was impressed with uh, Eddie Izzard's, uh, with it, Eddie Izzard's number of countries. I think it was up in the 50s. Wow. Yeah, and he speaks, uh, he does in French as well, right? Mm. Yeah. And maybe German. Yes, French and German. That's very, very and impressive. English. And it, well, yeah. yeah, and but the thing with Eddie Izzard is it's very interesting. That's one thing I learned. I actually met him in uh, in England last year. Uh, I went to one of his shows. He was doing a secret show in, in London, and he he actually doesn't write new material for that place. He j actually just translates phonetically, word for word. So mm. I think that's that's where we have a different approach. Like I'll, when I go to France, I'll write a whole new hour about them and kind of like the canadian perspective about them so i'll work on a whole act and i need to be there for years because i want to actually build a whole act around them but whereas he comes in he prefers just translating what he has and it's very general stuff it's not cultural it's a like general you know um, right. you know behavioral and and social stuff that that everybody can relate to and funny and do you do that with with uh, Punjabi and Hindi as well? Yeah, Punjabi and Hindi is interesting because what I do with Punjabi and Hindi is when I went to India, I actually come in a little bit earlier and write about them. But I also write about, uh, I tell them the perspective that my parents have about India because they left in the 60s. And that pure sort of, you know, um, idealistic utopian vision they have of india when they left and then what it really is and that gap and that's where the comedy happens i think for them is you know because they have that reputation you know parents have always said you know this is how you know india is and we should be proud of our mm -hmm. country and then you come there and you just make fun of everything that you see you know there are elephants on there are actually elephants on the road in <laughs> india i'm yeah. not i'm not joking there are elephants on the road it's a vehicle in india and cows and cows yeah but they're not vehicles. They're not vehicles. They're actually gods or they're just agents. in the way. Yeah, they're, they're deities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, Sam reminded me that uh, former guest of this program, Marcus Ryan from Australia, has played in the, around 50 countries. But of course, nobody knows Marcus Ryan. Jeez. <laughs> Ow. Marcus Ryan, 50 countries. I got to, I got to step up my game. <laughs> You're a slacker. Yeah. Perform in Southeast Asia and bang out a lot of countries there. Wow. Africa, you could do it. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but like Sugar Sammy's shows are like an event in these places, right? Oh, so I'm just looking at a map. You've done, you've done um, our TV specials in Saudi Arabia. That's true. In, <laughs> uh, in Dubai. In Dubai, I have. I've Amazing. done like yeah. Oh, them. in Dubai, not Saudi yeah. Arabia. Sorry, it was broadcast in Saudi Arabia, though. But I did do Dubai. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but you know what? We got to look up this Marcus Marcus Ryan thing. I don't know, man. It sounds fraudulent. <laughs> Fifty one. I don't believe that. I don't know, Marcus. Okay, <laughs> got to fact check that. 
Yeah. Uh, but out of all the places, I, I love to ask comics who've you know who've played uh, all over the world. Like, what is the strangest place you've played? Wow, strangest place. besides you know East Hastings. <laughs> um, listen, there are a few. I would say one that comes to mind is Northern Ireland. I remember, mm. I remember going to Northern Ireland to play, and my my UK agent booked me a gig there, so I flew in. It was a one nighter. You fly in, do the gig, fly back the next day. As I flew in, I was like, "Wow, this is kind of be the most depressing place I've ever seen in my life." I showed up, at, oh, yeah? I showed up at the gig, I showed up at the gig, and I forgot the name of the club. And the uh, the manager was like, "Okay, you got to do uh, forty five minutes, and um, and yeah, make sure you do forty five, and then uh, that's it. We'll call you a cab back to your back to your uh, hotel." I was like, "Okay, cool." Uh, I get on stage, and first of all, everyone's standing, so there are no seats, holding oh, no. beer, and they're all hammered. As I come on stage, I say, "Hey, how's it going, guys?" They just said, "Fuck you!" Like they just start yelling. And I think they just wanted to either fight or mess up my gig. Oh, man. I, I, I ended up doing the whole show. I got off stage. I looked at the, the manager of the place. I was like, man, that, that was horrible. He's like, that's one of the best gigs we've ever had. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you finished. <laughs> but, you know, makes you stronger. Definitely makes you stronger. So that was one of them. Well, I mean, your style, you you have your prepared material, but you are uh you just love talking to the crowd and and work and going wherever it goes. Yeah, but you know, you actually have to um you have to have room to speak. They don't. They, don't, they, they just weren't giving me room. But okay. I, I think I got away with it somehow. I forget how. But um, and another one that comes to mind is I did a gig. It was like in quotation marks a corporate gig for uh, it was like three hundred and fifty mushroom farmers in a barn. And I remember wait, this. When, wait, 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 wait. When they came to you and said we got a gig for you, yeah. or somebody asked you, they they told you it's in a barn, yeah, and it's mushroom workers. You yeah. knew this going in. I knew this going in, but I was so I'll tell you the context. I was so down on myself because I just done the Halifax Comedy Fest, and I'd done uh, I had three gigs. The first two I killed, right, and they were all TV gigs. And they told me you got to have three different killer sets for TV. That was a contract. I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. So the first two killer prepared. So what happened? A rookie mistake. This was like 2008 oh, or nine. <laughs> thought to myself, you know what? I killed it, man. This was all, I can do this. Eh. The, and the last night was the big gala at the Rebecca Cohn Theater. And it was the bigger gala, right? So this is like a thousand people. The other gigs were still TV gigs, but it was like a couple hundred people in the room. So a thousand seats. And I was like, I'll just wing it, man. Let me find. And. I'm good. <laughs> rookie mistake. Rookie mistake. And you learn this a couple of times in your career. Don't just get don't get too cocky. Wing a TV gig. Yeah. Oh, wait, just wait, man. You're good. You know you're good. You just killed it twice. Wing it. So I, I started winging it. Nothing. I get off stage. I bailed. I get off stage. And you know that it's like when you kill backstage, it's like you're the biggest hero out there. When you bomb, there's nothing lonelier because oh, because yeah. because nobody looks at you in the eyes. They all look yeah, at the floor. Yeah, it feels yeah. like like you know like uh, like the next morning after a bad one night stand. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is is the gig wasn't even close to the hotel, so I had to wait for the gig to be over to ride with the rest of the comics in the van. Oh, no back to the hotel as everybody celebrated how they killed on that gig and it just got really quiet for me and i was kind of sitting in the middle of everybody oh it was horrible <laughs> oh and i was so down on myself and that whole week i thought to myself i'm gonna quit why am i doing this this happens all the time i'm quitting i'm not gonna do this anymore just get an office job man office job why are you doing this why are you killing yourself office job you just gotta push some papers file some stuff they give you like you know 15 dollars an hour you'll be fine and uh, and then the phone rang, you know I couldn't get out of bed that whole week. Yeah. I was so depressed. And the phone rang, and uh, Jason Lawrence, who owns the Absolute Comedy Club in Ottawa, says to me, he "says Listen, I have this gig. Uh, I don't know if you want to do it. It's tomorrow. It's these mushroom farmers, Metcalf, Ontario. 
I was like, all right. He's like, it pays this much. I was like, fine. And he's like, but I got to warn you. Everyone bombs at that, <laughs> at that gig. <laughs> everyone? Oh, okay. He's like, so I won't be alone? Yeah. He's like, everyone bombs every year. He's like, every year, everyone's bombed at that gig. So I go on. Thankfully, I wasn't the only one there. There were like three other comics opening up for me. And everybody bombed. And then I got on stage. And I'm like, hey, what's up, uh, guys? My name's Sugar Sammy. And this guy yells out, I hate fucking packies. Oof. And throws a mushroom at my head. And the place got quiet. And I'm like, okay, I got to somehow salvage this place. And I salvaged it. It was like quiet. I was like, because everybody was kind of embarrassed and shocked. And I was like, well, I'm Indian. I hate Packies too. Why don't we start a Facebook group and go after these <laughs> motherfuckers? And that turned the crowd around. And then I just ripped into that guy all night and killed. And I, that kind of saved me uh, because I was like, okay, if I could kill here, you know, prepared, you know, I, okay, I know I could still do this job and don't quit, but cut, but never go in unprepared. That was a big lesson that I learned that day. Yeah. And so you've never bombed at like just for laughs, your home, big, important, uh, uh festival. Never. Like uh, you, you, you've always been like a boy scout prepared, prepared ever since that gig in 2008. I think I'd done that once before this uh where i'd made made that mistake in like 98 or 90 90 mm -hmm. or 97 i'd made that mistake and then i did it again in 2008 or 2009 i forget and then uh and then i never made that mistake again i remember when i booked my just for laughs gala as soon as i confirmed that in 2000 it was supposed to be july 2017 and I got the gig. We confirmed and uh, the gig on the phone in Oct like October 14, 2016. October 15th, I started working on that. I was like, I'm mm -hmm. I I'm not waiting a month before. I'm gonna work from today up until the gala in July to make sure that my sets when I host these galas are gonna be stellar. Yeah, and and that's just I mean because you have to do a set even though you're essentially an MC bringing on different acts, but I mean you're one of the acts. Yeah, so I, I have to do fifteen, ten to fifteen off the top, and then like another ten in the middle. So it's basically twenty twenty five minutes. So I wanted it to be stellar. So I already had some material that I'm like, okay, I could sacrifice this. I have it, it's fine. And then I just wanted to add more stuff and have it be really tight. And I really worked on it for months until uh, until the gala, and it paid off because it was an amazing gala, and I had so much fun. And my, you know, and I think it was something fun for the fans too. And I was, you know, I think that was one thing too. I always remember, you know, there are people who actually, you know, spend their hard-earned money to come and see you, and and you owe it to them to actually give them the best, you know. Yeah. Uh, but you got to do that now times four. If you say you 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 write specifically for a French audience, and I I don't know if you said Punjabi and and Hindi, or if you don't even perform that much in them. But I, presumably you write acts specifically for those languages too. Yeah, I'll always have material, and I'm always writing. You know, I write every day, so you know, as on the go too. So I'm always jotting down stuff and you know any chance i get i'm up there at an open mic or in a room trying out stuff so i don't lose the freshness of it you know because sometimes you'll write something and you look at it two weeks later and you're like what was that i don't even know how i said that or how it worked out so you, you just got to keep it fresh always and the sooner you bring it up on stage the more sense it'll make and the better you'll develop it you know do you write for your uh interactions Never. No, the interaction. Never? No, the interaction. Never. No, never. The interactions are all organic. And that's why we post them online because they're mm -hmm. moments that'll never happen again. So, and the fans love it because it's like, you know, content for them. And it's great for me because, you know, I haven't really put any great creative energy in writing that stuff because it just happens spontaneously. And yeah. once it's up there, the fans know it. So you can't do it on uh you know you can't do the same stuff on stage and a lot of these things in all fairness if you go on my youtube channel or facebook and you see all my videos a lot of these things are you know there's stuff that stuff that wouldn't happen in any other context it's unique moments that couldn't reproduce you couldn't reproduce on another day it's all spontaneous stuff you know you, you sometimes have back pocket things but i never post those online you know just little um you know safety emergency exits in case you get stuck but you know, and you can always go back to material, but everything that's online is all unique stuff. Great. I, I mentioned earlier your 
arch rival Russell Peters and uh, the parallels your careers have taken in both being international comics from Canada, being Indo-Canadian, and also making inroads into the States and being as big as you are in the rest of the world and then going into clubs. I saw you at a club in Atlanta, a video of you at a club in Atlanta and just, and getting known in a, in a, I guess an important market like the U S that must be a lot of fun being able to play those clubs again. I love playing clubs. I got to say, yeah. and even when I go and do like uh, open mics, my brother's a producer here in, in Montreal. He produces a lot of shows like hundred seaters and I jump on those all the time. Uh, and I got to say, there's nothing more fun than the, you know, the intimacy of a club and to have everybody close to you and to be able to, you know, work the crowd. I mean, that's where I learned how to do crowd work. And that's where I, you know, I hone all of my stuff. And to be honest, if you told me, okay, the rest of your career, all you're going to do is headline comedy clubs for the rest of your life. I don't think I'd be sad about that. You know? Yeah. I, I, Cause it's my favorite place to, to watch comedy. Oh, absolutely. Uh, especially sometimes you'll see, a, a, you know, a big name, somebody who plays theaters or even arenas drop into a club. And that's just electric when oh. you can see them in that intimate setting. Absolutely. I mean, to me, uh, I, I think I, I could probably go up on stage in, in a comedy club every day, you know, and, and just headline a comedy club every If I could do that and just just do that. I, I, I'd be very, very happy. I, I love the, uh, the energy and that, uh, crowd surrounding you and having them so close, you know, and making sure, sh- cause everybody feels like they're a part of the show. It actually feels like, you know, a couple hundred people in your living room when, when it's the right type of comedy club. And you guys have some really good ones in Vancouver and I've seen that it's expanded as well. Right. Well, you guys still have the laugh Sam, lines. You want to take that? Yeah. yeah. We, no laugh lines has yeah. changed now to a uh, house of comedy. The, uh, to Rick, Rick Bronson's House of Comedy. Okay. Yeah. And uh, we had Yuck. We still have Yuck Yucks. The comedy mix downtown is looking for a, a, a new, a new venue. So we just have Yuck Yucks downtown. But yeah, a lot of rooms. Mm-hmm. Where do you play in Montreal? Uh, Montreal, I'll play my brother's uh, nights. M- yeah. Most of the time. So my brother has a bunch of shows. And, you know, I just have to text him last second and be like, hey, man, uh, I'm just going to come down and be like, all right, no problem. And then I just close out the show with my papers and and just work on stuff. And, and, you know, it's just it's very comfortable. And he knows how to set the, you know, the room for me. He'll te- I'll be in my car, but like, text me when there's one person left so I can go up, <laughs> you know, so, I, you know, I don't, you know, draw attention. And, you know, I just like kind of going in, doing my stuff and then and then kind of leaving, you know, recording it and having it tight. So it's it's uh, it's a pretty good setup. But um, but yeah, yeah, there's only one English comedy club left here. It's the Comedy Nest. So when you're doing your brother's shows, are those in English? They're uh, mostly in English. He has one or two that are bilingual. So I love those too yeah. because Montreal's so bilingual. So I get to work on my Quebec material sometimes too. Like he has one. Uh, he had a couple this week that were in English, and he has another one that's bilingual. So I think that's going to be fun and interesting to to hit up a bilingual audience and try to find that bridge between the Anglos and the Francos here, you know? Yeah. When you're, when you perform in Punjabi, are you sugar Samir? <laughs> no, I'm still sugar savvy, but, oh, okay. but I haven't performed in Punjabi in a while, to be honest. It's been, okay. uh, but I've, I have a bunch of times in Vancouver. I've done shows for the Indian community, the Punjabi community there in, in, uh, in English and Punjabi. So bilingual, I've, I have done that. That's good. Oh, the first time I saw you was at a, a club that uh, Mike Breslin, not Mark Breslin, Mike Breslin opened. Is that a casino? Oh, right. It was. I forget the name of it. It was a Giggles or. No, was, I was thinking about that the other day. It was the Funny Bone. Funny Bone. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I saw you on that show. You, I think you were headlining and Graham Clark was on. I forget who else. Uh, there was. Um... Uh, Jeffrey Yu, is that possible? Jeffrey Yu, he doesn't do comedy anymore that I Jeffrey, know of. He was yeah. so funny, man. Jeffrey Yu. He's very funny. And then Paul... Um, Paul Bay. Paul Bay, that's right, Paul Bay. And Ron Jossel. And who? Um, Ron Jossel was Ron. on it, yes. It's all coming back to me now. Yeah, Paul Bay, how's he doing? Is he doing stand-up? 
He's doing great. He's not doing stand up. He's a big time podcast producer of um what do you call it, Sam? He 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 does um Oh it's it's it's, it's fiction. A, yeah. It's a podcast. It's a, but a story. Okay. Well no, it's not yeah, he writes it. Yeah. He's not on it. And and he produces them and they're like these dark, scary kind of stories and they're hugely popular in the US. Oh, amazing. Good for him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was good. Hey, group. it's time again for another uh cold read if you can go down to the bottom all right <laughs> this is international sensation sugar savvy and you're listening to what's so funny with my old pal guy and my new pal sam on i can't see what it says oh see okay there sorry i have to scroll okay i'll do it again <laughs> <laughs> This is International Sensation, Sugar Sammy, and you're listening to What's So Funny with my old pal Guy and my new pal Sam on CFRO 100.5 FM Vancouver Co-op Radio. Oh, that was so nice of you to add that extra stuff in there. Thanks. (laughs) That was sweet. Um, Who's your best friend in comedy? Um, I think my best friend in comedy, I think I have two. Uh, I don't see them as much as I wish I could. Um, uh, my two, uh, best friends in comedy are Massimo Canestrero. I don't know if you know Massimo, comedian from nope. uh, Montreal. We've toured a lot together. Um, mm. he's, uh, he's now moved to the States. Uh, he's a lot of fun. He's a lot of fun to hang out with and he's brilliant and he gets better every year. Uh, and Deliso Chapanda. I don't know if you guys know of Deliso. Mm. Uh, from Malawi, now uh, a huge star in the UK. He did uh, uh, he did uh, the Got Talent show there, uh, UK's mm-hmm. Got Talent, and he came in number three and just filled up theaters. He got signed. I think there was a huge tour there for him. Uh, he's doing a big theater. He was doing a big theater tour before the pandemic, oh. um, and he just toured South Africa as well. He's uh, he's a he's really great and a really good writer. So. If you guys ever want him on the show or Massimo, let me know. I'll connect to you guys. Thank you. And if you were judging him on that British talent show, <laughs> would you have uh, Golden Buzzer? Golden ripped buzzer. him a new one? No, no, Golden Buzzer. You should see his. If you guys get a chance to see his performance, he actually got a Golden Buzzer. Um, I don't know what that is, but it sounds good. Uh, yeah, Golden Buzzer is so instead of just going to the next round, uh, each judge has the discretion of hitting a golden buzzer where you go directly to the finals because you were so good. So oh, wow. outstanding. Wow. And Deliso got that. He killed it. He killed it. It was so edgy and racy for TV. What he did is two performances. Uh, so you guys get a ch- chance to check it out. Deliso Chapanda on God Talent. Check it out on YouTube. He's all over there. Oh, cool. I definitely will do that. Hey, going back to your youth in Quebec, you were born there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Born and raised in Montreal, yeah. You went to Ecole Lavoie? Yes. Go Tigris. No, I don't know. What, <laughs> what is their nickname? We had, we had the, uh, our team was the Dragons, Les Dragons. Les Dragons. Yeah. I was wondering about French school uh, team names. Because, are they all in French? They're all in French. So Les Dragons, it's just the Dragons, you know. It's fine. W- are there some other common ones? I don't know the other ones. I, we never played oh. anybody. We were called the Dragons, but we played no one but ourselves. We just had we just had practice. <laughs> <laughs> Did you play sports? Uh, I played a lot of ball hockey growing up. Lots okay. of ball. Well, hockey. well, of course you didn't play anyone. There's not a ball hockey league. No, there are ball you hockey. Play a real sport. <laughs> but loads of ball hockey. I mean, because it was easy and the equipment was cheap, and we didn't have to. Buy it. My parents didn't have to buy new equipment every year. I mean, we, we didn't grow up super wealthy, but we'd play ball hockey uh, incessantly. I mean, we played, we'd come home after school, drop off our, our bags and like just hit, hit, the, hit the community center or hit up the streets and just start playing ball hockey. I mean, you don't see that anymore. You don't see a lot of kids playing in the streets as much as you used to, you know? No. No, I never do. Yeah. I'm not looking. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Good point. <laughs> Which is bad for them, but good, good for us, and good, and good, for, good for our cars. You know, yeah, good for our cars. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and Sam, to be truthful, Sam has a restraining order yeah. from high schools. So. Uh, uh, not surprised. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you weren't on. A, you weren't on a. I mean, your school must have had volleyball and basketball and whatever teams yeah we did i mean i don't think we ever played anyone that's the thing i thought i don't think we could afford uniforms we were really dragon but all we did was practice 
<laughs> this, this was very suspicious. You don't have a great memory of your youth, do you? I have great memory, but it was all practice. Like it was, <laughs> it was and and the thing is, I remember. Huh. I think it was it was the dream of someday playing somebody else. So you, you know? were on the C team here. Like we weren't even a backup. They just no. you know they told you that you don't play anybody. You just practice. Well, the A yeah. team's going to play. You know, mile end high or whatever. Yeah, we were just huh. there practicing and they're like there's no competition yeah. just stay there <laughs> That's what they told you. don't worry about it don't worry about it just keep practicing you're great <laughs> did, did, were you uh were you a funny guy in high school uh yeah i think i got i was shy in the Popular? beginning uh yeah i think the the last two last couple of years of high school is when i think yeah, i kind of uh you know uh, gained some confidence and and started being you know more and more present and made myself known. I think the first couple of years it was an adjustment, just kind of uh, in a new environment and you know figuring out how how to how to fit in. And then I think I just kind of figured it out the last couple of years. And, and I think the last two years was really good. Have you been to a reunion? Uh, we and lorded over them. No, we we had your success. <laughs> no, we had a Zoom reunion. I mean, we but it's the boys who keep seeing each other all the time. I'm still I still hang out with my my high school friends. It's funny. I actually talk about this in my act as my old friends and my new friends and the difference between the two. You know, so uh, it's mm. so funny. You know, when you when you're in, living this life and you came from a different life, it's like you know your friends are you know they'll have similar but different conversations with you you know like you, you know your friend from your you know your new friends will be like hey man i just bought a mercedes benz check out my leather seats you know my old friends will be like hey man i just got my bathroom redone check out my leather seats you know like <laughs> <laughs> so it's a whole different life and uh but I yeah and those old those old friends uh because they knew you before they don't treat you any differently they don't really even know about your new life, right? No, I mean, I think it's just hanging out and we're, we haven't changed. You know, we still have the same type of interactions and we're still as goofy with each other. And uh, and we still have, uh, you know, the same type of sense of humor. So, uh, yeah, it, it, to me, I think that's kind of great, too, because it keeps you I think it keeps you writing in a very honest way when you don't let you know, the new, the newer life get to you, because I think I've always done that. Even when I went to France, I started from scratch, even though I had a I had big success here in Quebec. When I went there, I said, I want to start from the bottom. So I started doing open mics, which was the right approach and writing new stuff and testing it. And, and then starting in a small, like in a, you know, 60 seater, then to a hundred seater and just moved my way up the ranks slowly, you know, and then got scouted by the got talent people. And then, then it really took another level but i never came in with the approach of hey i'm big somewhere else so you guys should actually really pay attention to what i'm about to mm. do on stage you know you proved it yeah That's so it. i earned it yeah you yeah. gotta earn it yeah you gotta uh keep it real yeah sammy you gotta keep riding the metro i did keep taking the bus i did up until i got the tv show i did and then i can't oh okay. but, uh, yeah up until i got the tv show i did i did take the metro and take the bus because it's actually the best way to get around in paris you're not going to get around in cars uh, as fast it actually takes a little bit longer to get to your destination by car sometimes than it does by metro so until you got the tv show and now when you go out what is it like uh i don't that's the thing is like i i get picked up at the house and then get driven and then get driven back and i just sort of you know we just do uber eats and stay home and really yeah i mean who's we you keep saying we oh, who's we yeah my girlfriend and i so my girlfriend travels oh. with me and she works with me and uh so Great. we're, we're kind of where's she from she's from toronto yeah no one's perfect nice. yeah no one's perfect so she's <laughs> she's from toronto but uh yeah we met 7 years ago so we've been together 7 years and she's uh She's amazing. Uh, we um, we uh, we get to travel together, work together, and um, and uh, yeah. So it's fun to actually. I think the only way we can get by in Paris is we stay home because I think we just get too much attention when we're out there. Because because mm -hmm. the, the show is like four million viewers a week, you know. So it's pretty big. Do you watch comedians in cars getting coffee? I did start watching it. I actually really like that show. Really good. And what I like to me, it's a lesson. 
Jerry Seinfeld's giving a lesson to guests on how to be a celebrity because he doesn't care. He goes anywhere and people come up to him. He'll go, hey, nice to meet you. Thanks. And then be on his way. And then there's some guests that's just like, oh, I can't go out because people are going to come up to me. And Jerry's like, who cares? So say hi and leave. Yeah. See, it's different because Jerry Seinfeld does comedy that's pretty neutral. Like he'll talk about toothpaste, airlines. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I go into politics and nationalism and, you know, and talk about, you know, race, religion, things like that. So I, I actually gets a lot of different types of attention too that, you know, that, uh, that sometimes is un is un, uh, unwelcome and, you know, that's kind of tough to deal with. So I think I'd, sometimes I'd rather be home than, you know, nearly get punched in the face. <laughs> Fair point. Yeah. Point, point taken. Yeah. So that's, that's the difference. That's the difference. But if I, if I had stand comedy like Jerry Seinfeld, I'd probably, I'd probably <laughs> be okay with what, cause no one's going to go, Hey man, that bit you did about, uh, toothpaste. Uh, yeah, I didn't like that. I like Crest. Come on, man. yeah, <laughs> go to hell, Jerry. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's that's the difference. Is I, 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 because I go into politics and and you know race and religion. Sometimes it gets a little bit. Uh, it gets a little bit tough. So I assume that you've had some experiences where people have uh, sort of taken offense maybe at a position of yours or you know taking the piss out of something i know that you you had issues with the quebec language laws and you posted billboards and things like that uh did it get heated ever like is this why is this based on experience oh for sure i mean i've i've uh you know i've been uh i've you know i've definitely had death threats that was in the news where they had to shut down one of my shows uh, oh, because there was a bomb threat. Yeah, there was a bomb threat. Um, so that I've had that I've had, uh, you know, people verbally attack you on the streets, uh, you know, nearly physical. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I think, you know, when you go into the hardcore right wing nationalists, especially like, you know, sometimes in certain countries, the Christian nationalists, you can be touching some, uh, some nerves there, you know, hitting some nerves. So you get that for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the only reason, not not anything else. I mean, you know, everywhere else, I'm I'm very happy to be walking around and just living normally. But there are times where you have to, you have to just for your own safety, be like, okay, I'm just gonna stay in. You know? Wow, who knew? Yeah, who knew yeah. that uh, making people laugh would get them so angry? I know, I know. I mean, um, that's it. Sometimes I feel like comedians need more security than uh, boy bands. You know, well, for different yeah. reasons. Different reasons. Like, oh, boy band, what's the worst going to happen? They're going to rip up one of your Gucci shirts. You know, <laughs> they're going to try to steal some buttons off of your shirt, try to sleep with you. Oh my God, that's horrible. These women tried to sleep with me. This girl tried to, tried to go down on me. It's horrible. <laughs> Someone call security. But why do you need to be so controversial? That's why can't you just tell dick jokes like Sam? Hey. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I like, I like, that's the type of comedy I've always liked. You know, I've always been a fan of that type of comedy. And so what do you do? You filter yourself, you tell yourself, okay, I'm not going to do that kind of stuff because uh, it's going to come along with a lot of heat. So why don't we just stay in this other zone and do this other comedy that you're not really into? Mm -hmm. But, you know, so I don't think I'd be satisfied at the end of the day. I think um, I, I like going and 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 you know getting and doing that type of comedy i've been a fan of those type of comedians forever you know so so you know i think you always want to do the type of comedy you grew up liking as well yeah yeah i know you say you your influences were eddie murphy dave chappelle martin lawrence uh but i'm wondering when when you say somebody is an influence like they were mm -hmm. What does that look like? What does that exactly mean that they were an influence other than just liking them? Well, I mean, what I like about a lot of these comedians, especially coming from, you know, I think I identified most growing up with the African-American comedians because they came from, you know, marginal places. And they had that point of view that came from the outside, that outsider's point of view within a society. And to me, I think that's always been very interesting. And that's sort of the way I see things, you know, whether, no matter where I am, I always feel like an outsider. I mean, whether it's in France, because I actually am from somewhere else, uh, 
uh, when I'm in uh, Quebec, you know, I always feel like an outsider because I feel like, you know, I've been made to feel like an outsider, like I don't belong here sometimes. And then in Canada, uh, you know, they always look at me as the guy from Quebec. So you always have that outsider's perspective. And when you're in in the U.S., when I'm in the U.S., it's the same thing. I'm that Canadian who's coming to the U.S. and has that Canadian perspective. So I always felt that um, growing up and I felt that in my stand-up, but I also think it served me really well. And I think when you come from that point of view, your your um, your view on things and your perspective can only be controversial because it's a perspective you don't hear uh, as much as uh, you do in the mainstream, you know? And, and when you give those three and specifically as influences i know sometimes the media likes to ask uh obvious questions like who are your influences guilty uh hmm. and so you got to give names that people have heard but were there are there any like no names or lesser known influences um that you had that the real comedy nerd will know maybe the general public won't um look i i mean i can't say bill burr but i used to say bill burr 10 years ago and people were like oh yeah well. but bill burr i think to me right now is the best stand up working today um uh i really loved uh i mean growing up chris rock you know the classics chris rock i love the brits as well yeah. ricky gervais uh, is definitely a huge influence. Sasha Baron Cohen. I mean, talk about someone with balls <laughs> who probably gets death threats every day. I mean, this guy oh, yeah. must must be one of those guys too, you know. And I I love what he does, you know, as well. So, um, um, let me see if there any, there's anyone. I mean, there definitely is. It's just probably not coming to mind right now. But you know, you look at a lot of the ca Canadians as well, and and you think to yourself, you know, we have such a uh, you know, we're spoiled here with riches in terms of comedy, like, you know, some of the greats like Mike Wilmot, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, Steve Patterson. You look at these guys, uh, you know, they're amazing. Joey Elias, I think in Montreal, you know, watching him growing up, you know, I still think he's probably the best uh, crowd worker in the industry and wow. uh, and I think deserves a, a, a much better bigger recognition than he gets. I think he's huge. David Pride, I think another Montrealer who's great writer, great writer. But I mean, people say that, but they don't, they also don't, I think, you know, it's one of those things is he's a great writer, but he's also a very good performer. So I think he's, you know, mm -hmm. again, those, those guys who are uh, underrated in, in their fields, but who, who deserve way more recognition than they're getting, you know? That's what I love. I love the deep dive where where you you mention names like that, and some people have to go, "Oh, I got to Google this guy. Who's this? Who's this?" All right, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. And and do you have different influences for the different languages, or is, or does a Dave Chappelle or Eddie Murphy uh, cross over to when you're performing in French or Punjabi or Hindi? Yeah, I think it's just uh, to me, it's like you know, that's the thing. It's it's never been. You know, my influences are my influences, but I, I, you know, I never said, OK, well, well, let me go see what's happening in other languages. I just kind of said, OK, I'm just going to do what I do in a different language, but keep my style, you know. But I, I definitely think, um, you know, you're always the sum of your influences. And I think everybody I've mentioned there uh, had a big part in shaping the type of comedy that I do today. And uh, you do have style. We got to say that, <laughs> <laughs> Sammy. We could talk to you uh, all night, but it's been great. It's been ten years since I our know. last talk, and uh, we'll have to make it sooner. Yeah, we got to do this the more next often, one for sure. Yeah, and, and you'll be our new middleman, giving us uh, guests from all over the world. Uh, deal, anytime. Just shoot me a text or an email, and I'll set you guys up. It'd be a pleasure. Awesome. Thanks very much. Uh, and uh, good luck with the uh, lockdown and hope you get back to work soon. I know your website. Uh, what is the website? Uh, easy. Sugarsammy.com. And then, you know. Oh, the no one all over <laughs> And the usual uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter as well. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it has dates there. Like you, you're booked. I, we don't know yet if it will happen. But uh, well, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. All right. Uh, au revoir, mon ami. Au revoir. Merci, Guy. Merci, Sam. Au revoir. Oh, de rien. De rien. <laughs> Talk to you later. Thank Bye. you, guys. Thanks. Take care.